Hello again, everybody. So today we're going to get into world climatic and geographic zones. This is some basic introductory material. We're going to be talking about a lot of these concepts and general places uh, when we talk about the regions of the world this year in class. So I just wanted to introduce you to some stuff because it's very important. Why is it so important? Well, it really does impact every single aspect of our lives. When you look at things like climate and weather, which I'll talk about again in a moment, um, from something small like what do you wear each day to do you live in an area with natural disasters so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, what are the resources in geographically speaking? What type of land for growing crops? What type of land for animals to graze on? Do you have metals or woods or coal or oil? These are things that you need. Also, what about your population? For instance, the size of your population will determine what your country can achieve. For instance, if you have a larger population, you have a much greater chance to have some pretty awesome people in that population that will contribute to your overall society. As well as you have a greater size population, you can farm more, you can have a bigger army for defense or offense, depending on who you are. It really does help. Um, the location and size of the population will also impact actions of the government. We're going to talk about that in a variety of different ways. You know, does the government have geographic barriers that it has to overcome or not? Um, transportation and communication. Do geographical features get in the way? Can we run roads into certain areas? Can we have uh, safe septic systems? What about the internet? What about phone? All of these different types of things have to go into consideration because this is really do how we do live today. And so the geography impacts you in just so many different ways, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. Now, a quick word on weather and climate. Weather and climate are not the same. Weather is the temporary condition of the atmosphere at a place and really more specifically at a time. Look outside. Whatever you see is going on, whatever you feel is going on, that is weather. Climate, however, is the overall average weather at a place over a period of time. And typically that period of time is somewhere between, you know, like 20 and 30 years. When you hear a weather person that says like the average high today normally is this and we're either above or below normal, that's because of data that has been taken over a large amount of years, as well as things like regular climate disasters or you know natural disasters those things you know is it a hurricane place is it an earthquake place all of those things go into climate whereas weather again is that initial thing what's going on right now all right so as we go around we're going to be talking about various areas of the world and the first one i'm going to talk about is the tundra these are northern areas there actually is no real tundra in the south i'll explain later um, about 20% of the world's land is tundra. It is mostly around the poles, as you can see on the map on the right. It is incredibly cold. And believe it or not, there is not that much water. Yes, there's a lot of ice, but it doesn't rain or snow that much. So you don't actually have trees. Uh, the growing season is so short, so it's very difficult to grow crops. You really only have two seasons here. It is summer and it is winter. So it is not cold or it is cold cold uh, or really not as cold um, and in the northern northern reaches so when you're really at like Iceland right here and above um, you will have significant amounts of time where either you will not see the sun or you will uh, only see the sun for instance right now in Iceland in what we're in August uh, actually, in July, they typically, the sun would set, say, around 12 midnight, yes, 12 midnight, and then it would come up at 2 a.m., so you get like two hours of darkness. Um, it is absolutely crazy, and then in the wintertime, you know, somewhere around late December, early January, the sun will go down, and then it doesn't come up for like eight weeks, so definitely a challenge for people to live in these areas, uh, but some people do. Um, and you have a variety of different uh, animals in which to interact with, and some aren't so bad, some are a little scary, anything from foxes to polar bears to grizzly bears. Um, these are all animals that live in the tundra. Uh, also, you can get wild, a good amount of wildlife because there's no humans there to mess it up. 
And this is what we're looking at. You know, the, the right is the winter time. It's just flat. It's snow. It's ice. And then in the summertime, you get grasses and wildflowers. That's on the left there, but it really doesn't last too long. And in general, this area is what we call permafrost, that the land, for the most part, is frozen very deep down permanently. And here's a great example of people who have managed to live in this area for thousands of years, and that is the Inuit, uh, living primarily in, say, places like Alaska, Canada, um, have found a way to survive long term. As we start to come down a little bit, we have an area called the Taiga. These are the vast northern forests in places like Canada and Russia. This is like Siberia. Lots of like pine trees and conifer type trees. You get a lot of snow in the winter. It's really rainy in the summer, but the crops aren't super available. Okay, the soil's not great. Um, so you can't grow a lot of food, so you don't have a lot of people. Surprisingly, there are a large amount of animals because, again, there aren't people there to, to kill them. Really should be unsurprisingly messed up that word, but that's okay. Um, but in these regions, we also have lots of minerals and natural resources and things like oil and gas. So we definitely have a human presence in here, if anything, to extract those materials. Now, the interesting thing about trees is, well, I'm sorry, I'll get that the next slide. So here are some animals that you see, a lynx, river otters, wolverines. Don't mess with a wolverine. They will break you. Things like bald eagles. So here you see lots of trees, and actually some of the world's largest forests are these great taiga forests of the north. They pump out a lot of oxygen, so they actually impact the weather. Uh, trees don't need the best soil to grow. They need some soil, they need some nutrients, but really they're more dependent on, you know, water. Um, crops are the ones that need more nutrients from the soil, and so that's why in areas you can get tons and tons of uh, plants in the form of, say, like bushes and trees, as you see here, or in the jungles, like vines and stuff like that. But crops, it's a lot harder to grow, again, because of the lack of nutrients in the soil. We also have across the world these vast grasslands. These are rolling hills and grass that really cover tremendous amounts of area in the world, as you can see there. The most common ones are, uh, for instance, we have uh, things in the called the prairie. That's in lower areas, so areas that aren't elevated. So the great example of that, I'll show you a picture later, is North America. You see here the mouse. Um, no mountains. You got mountains over here. You got mountains over there, but you really don't have mountains here. Um, the steppes in Asia, that's this massive area over here. Okay, we have the Pampas down here in South America and the Savannah. The Savannah is really famous because that's where you get all these uh, giant herds of animals. I'll talk about that more in Africa. Uh, there is some rain, but it's sporadic, so you actually don't get a lot of trees, but you can grow a decent amount of crops. Communities, for the most part, are small here. Um, actually, in Asia and Africa, many of those uh, communities are, um, I, I don't, not quite hunter-gatherer, but they are nomadic. Um, you can also get really severe weather in these areas. That's why we often say you get some of the toughest people in the world that often live in these grasslands because you could have a bright sunny day and then particularly like in North America and then like, boom, there's a, a tornado and you're, you're running for cover. Very, very strong storms can come through these areas. The weather can be either really hot or sometimes really cold depending on where you're at. So in North America, in Africa, it can get like really hot. In Asia, it gets really, really cold. And But this is where we'll often see cattle ranches and stuff like that. So the grasslands are really an important part to our overall ecosystem. And here we have things like, you know, uh, wild horse on the left, your buffalo or bison on the right, honeybees and uh, groundhawks there. Here's the prairie that we're talking about. You see those hills. Okay, nice and flat. You can actually see I got some cows in the foreground here. Okay, and then if you go over to places like Africa, you'll find things like elephants and lions and your giraffe, and then you can have some big crocodiles in the rivers, so a little bit different than, say, in North America. Here's a village in the savannah, so sometimes you can get a little bit of trees, but for the most part, it's grass. 
All right, where does most of the population in the world, however, live? The deciduous or the temperate forest or the continental weather. There's so many descriptions here. Uh, the eastern United States, Europe and China. This is your four season climates, different zones from north to south, though. So like it's the in the northern areas, the winter lasts a little bit longer. In the southern areas, the summer lasts a little bit longer. You can grow tons and tons of crops, so you have lots of people. And if you think about it, largest areas of populations of the world, here you have Australia, of course, China, which is the the you know, largest country in the world, of course, population side, the bulk of their population lives right here. You can see how big the country itself is, but bulk of it live there. You have the Koreas, Japan, of course, Europe, and then United States. Okay, and variety of animals from the platypus, who we don't even know what that thing does. It's crazy and weird. It's also venomous. It's got like a venomous spike on its back foot. So don't pick up a, don't pick up a platypus. We got red squirrel, deer, black bears. Okay, our four season climate here. You can see this is a picture of actually up in New Hampshire as the trees are about to drop their leaves. They turn those beautiful reds and golds. Okay, your basic kind of forest. And for the people where we live, the promenade. All right, now, one of the areas of the world that is growing, and this is not good, which is desert. Um, you can actually have hot and cold deserts. The only requirement is little to no water. That's all it is. Some deserts do have oases so or access to underground water. So we do have people living in those areas, particularly places where you're going to see people live in the desert here in North America, uh, going across here in Northern Africa in the Middle East, uh, and some in Australia. But some of these deserts, like right here, this is the Atacama Desert. No one, not many people live here. These Central Asian deserts are really hard. Uh, people kind of migrate through there, but they don't necessarily live there. Um, you can get a large amount of animals, uh, snakes and scorpions and birds and, and insects and stuff like that. Um, but it really doesn't support a lot of life overall. Uh, so some of those animals, again, that you'd see, you have some lizards, like that's a Gila monster up on the left there, and I said scorpion snakes and some birds. Um, but, I mean, these deserts are huge, and this is like kind of the vision. This is the Sahara Desert, um, which is not that old a desert, um, but uh, you have sand dunes that can be hundreds of feet high and just this never-ending sea of sand. I mean, the Sahara Desert is actually so big you could fit the United States in it, just to give you an idea. And this is where we get the hottest temperature ever in the world, uh, and a desert in the United States. This is Furnace Creek Ranch in Death Valley, the United States. This is also uh, one of the lowest places in the world, uh, the only lower place above um, the ground is in uh, the Dead Sea in Israel, and... We do have a temperature reading of 134.1 degrees Fahrenheit, which is crazy. However, this is the largest desert in the world. And if you don't know what that is, that is Antarctica. Yes, Antarctica is a desert. Um, the entire continent is a desert. It gets very, very little snowfall or rain. But the reason why we don't think of it as a desert because it's covered in ice and it is and everything is frozen. It just stays frozen, but very little of it falls. You people, oh, but I've seen pictures of, of like what looks to be like blinding snowstorms. It's not actually a lot of snowstorms about snow falling from the sky. It's more or less the wind down here is crazy. And so it moves all of that snow around. And ironically enough, not only in a desert, you would, of course, expect to see the highest temperature in the world, but we also have the lowest temperature all, uh, ever recorded, and that is in the Vostok Station in Antarctica at minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So the coldest and the hottest temperatures ever recorded, both in deserts. And here is the example of a desert village. Again, you do have access to water in some areas as well as domestication of animals like the uh, camel. So people can still find a way to live in the desert. 
Then we have the rainforest or the jungle. Um, these are the areas of the world where we see the most amount of life when we talk about animal and plant life. Um, there are two seasons. It's always hot, so it's either hot and wet or hot and dry. Uh, they typically measure rain in feet per year. The, the, it's remarkable. In northern India, we'll talk about a place that actually had recorded um, almost 200 feet of rain in a given year, a place called Megalaya, so it's crazy. Um, giant forest, rivers, um, a huge amounts of life. Uh, the soil is just okay. So believe it or not, not a lot of people live in the jungles. Okay, however, the jungles have lots of natural resources. Some jungles have oil underneath them. Uh, we lose a lot of things for hardwoods, um, things like Brazil nuts or cashews or something like that. Spices. We'll talk about that when we get to Asia. Spices is very important in the in uh, the jungle areas of the world. So there are a lot of resources there, and many of the plants that we use for medicines also come from these regions. Okay, and of course, these are some of the spectacular animals you see. You've got your tiger, which is the largest and most awesome cat in the world. Your gorillas, birds of paradise on the top right. We have frogs. We don't want to touch those because that can make us hallucinate. It's crazy. And again, on the bottom left there, that's like one snake. That's crazy. And for those of you that don't like spiders, you might not want to go to these jungles either. That's a giant huntsman spider that's in Southeast Asia and Australia. Yes, that is a spider. It's real. Watch out. These things hunt birds. It's crazy. But this is what we're talking about. Here's the Amazon River in Brazil, and you can see the thick, thick jungle here. Um, the rainforest areas of the world always have clouds because there's so much moisture. You can see a satellite picture here. There's always clouds in the sky because it's either water that is in the rivers or water that's in the air that is condensed into clouds. And some people live in these areas as well. This is a Koroai tree house in Papua New Guinea. Um, people do live in the jungle. Some of them build their houses up real high, which I think is really, really cool. Um, but again, not that many. And the final area of the world that I'm going to talk about is the Alpine region. These are areas that surround the mountains of the world. Um, some areas to have people, but most, um, but you must be ready for extreme temperatures, really cold, um, sudden things like avalanches. It's it's it can be tough, but it can also be very beautiful. Um, they also impact the weather of the world. So, for instance, you see if we look here, these are the Rocky Mountains. Well, wind that can come down from the Rocky Mountains go across the Plain States, one of the reasons why this area gets a lot of tornadoes. Now, rain. So I talked about northern India just a moment ago. This is the area of northern India that gets tons of rain. Well, this is the Himalaya Mountains. These are the tallest mountain chains in the world, right? So what you get is clouds that will come with moisture from the ocean. They come across India, and when they get to the Himalayas, they have to dump all their rain because the clouds can't move above the Himalayas. Thus, this is huge jungle area. So very, very impactful. And, you know, some animals. We have a snow leopard there on the right. That's an, uh, a giant ram on the, oh, sorry, snow leopard on the left, giant ram on the right. These huge, cool animals. Um, here's a small little town in the Swiss Alps that people can live in. Very beautiful in the summertime. And the, we do have some people that live way up in the mountains. La Rinconada, Peru is the highest city in the world. Uh, at 16,830 feet above sea level. If you or I were to go up there, we would immediately get lightheaded. We might get altitude sickness. It is crazy. Um, the next six highest cities in the world are actually all in Tibet. Tibet is typically the area of the world. I'll talk about that when we get to Asia, where the, the largest amount of population is above sea level um, or high above sea level. This is a little mounting town. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's a rough place to live. Um, there's no actual sanitation system, so that gets a little dicey, but there's gold and silver in these mountains, and that's why people live there, okay? All right, guys, so that's just a quick general introduction to the regions of the world that we're going to be talking about. Hopefully, you learned a little something, and we'll kind of expand upon this in class, okay? All right, take care, guys.